Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone to this webinar on global vaccine inequity, a tale of two pandemics. My name is Roy Culpepper. I chair the group of 78. First, I'd like to acknowledge that the city of Ottawa, the place from which I'm making these introductory remarks, is in the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. We must recognize that Indigenous communities have for many generations stewarded the rivers, coasts, forests, and the land. We must learn from their example, respect their legacy, and support their ongoing quest for justice. Since its origins in 1981, the Group of 78 has promoted dialogue about a progressive Canadian foreign policy based on the principles of sustainable peace, social justice, and survival of our planet in the face of modern human activity. Our annual conference this year is focused on the third of these principles, planetary survival. Specifically, our topic is climate adaptation, building resilience in the climate emergency. The conference is to start on September the 25th. Please check our website in the coming weeks for details. Our subject for today's webinar could hardly be more topical. The COVID-19 pandemic has been raging for the past 18 months. After an intense period of research last year, several vaccines were developed. An inoculation campaign has been underway with astonishing speed. However, there is a huge problem. Large parts of the world, particularly the developing countries, have been almost completely left out. There has been a glaring problem of global vaccine injustice. And the fact remains that no one is safe from the pandemic until everyone is safe. Just a few days ago, leaders of the group of seven countries convened in the UK to formulate their global response. They pledged collectively to donate 1 billion doses of vaccine, half of which will come from the United States, along with 100 million doses from Canada. They committed to ending the pandemic by 2022. Is this commitment enough? Many would share this trenchant response from Oxfam, which is worth citing, and I quote, this G7 summit will live on in infamy. Faced with the biggest health emergency in half in a century and a climate catastrophe that is destroying our planet, they have completely failed to meet the challenges of our times. Never in the history of the G7 has there been a bigger gap between their actions and the needs of the world. In the face of these challenges, the G7 have chosen to cook the books on vaccines and continue to cook the planet. We don't see the need to wait for history to judge this summit a colossal failure. It is plain for all to see." End of quote. So what would it take to end the pandemic by 22 and prevent or keep in check future pandemics? To answer these daunting questions, we are delighted and honored to host a senior official from the World Health Organization, a distinguished Canadian medical researcher, bioethicist and public health expert. It's impossible to do justice to his many accomplishments and his public service in this brief introduction, but I'll try. Dr. Peter Singer is Assistant Director General of the World Health Organization and Special Advisor to the Director General, Dr. Tedros Adhanom, Gabriasis. He supports the Director General in efforts to transform the WHO into an organization sharply focused on impact at the country level. From 2008 to 2018, Dr. Singer was Chief Executive Officer of Grand Challenges Canada. During this period, Grand Challenges Canada raised $450 million to support 1,000 innovations in more than 90 countries which have the potential to save hundreds of thousands of lives. From 1996 to 2006, he was Sun Life Financial Chair 
and director of the University of Toronto Joint Centre for Bioethics. He's also a professor of medicine at the University of Toronto. In recognition of his work in 2011, he was appointed Officer of the Order of Canada for his contributions to health, research and bioethics, and for his dedication to improving the health of people in developing countries. As a researcher, Dr. Singer has published over 300 articles and mentored hundreds of students. He studied internal medicine at the University of Toronto, medical ethics at University of Chicago, public health at Yale University, and management at Harvard Business School. He has also served his community as board chair of Branksom Hall, an internationally minded school for girls. Peter, many, many thanks and welcome to this group of 70 uh, webinar and thank you so much for speaking. And to kick things off, I thought I'd start you with a question. As I mentioned, the G7 has pledged 1 billion doses of vaccine, but this is a far cry from the 11 billion needed, according to the WHO, to vaccinate the entire world. How can the difference in 10 billion do uh, doses be made up? Can it be made up? Over to you. Right. First, first of all, thank you. It's, it's very humbling for me to be here with this, uh, with this wonderful group, and I really appreciate the invitation very much. Uh, and you're right, you know, the problem of vaccine inequity is the defining challenge of 2021. Uh, it's those 11 billion doses I'm going to come to specifically in a moment, because there is a very significant gap and there's a lot of inequity. And let me just take a step back and maybe walk through some of the issues for a few minutes. First thing to say is, um, this is a this is a tale of two pandemics, you know, to riff a little bit off Charles Dickens. It's the best of times, it's the worst of times. In Canada, what we see is cases falling, we see um, things opening up, and we see high vaccination rates. 65% actually today in terms of first dose in Canada. The second dose is somewhere between 10 and 20%, I'd say 15. But the other pandemic is in many other parts of the world. Uh, the vaccination rates, for example, on the African continent are in the range of one to two percent. We see the fire raging in countries like Uganda, like uh, South Africa, like Namibia, and in different parts of the world. So even though the global cases have been falling for the seventh straight week in a row, the fire is burning hot in some parts of the world. And uh, what we saw, sadly, in India two to four weeks ago, we are starting to see elsewhere. Of the 2.3 billion doses of vaccine that have been distributed, the distribution has been very, very inequitable. So two out of three people in Canada have had a first dose one out of 100 or one out of 50, depending on where on the African continent or less, have had a first dose. And these vaccines, as you say, are highly effective at preventing death, preventing hospitalization, and even reducing transmission. So to get closer to your question, uh, first, let's talk about why that vaccine inequity is bad. And then let's go to what is the source of scarcity, including the doses. That uh, inequity is bad because of epidemiological reasons. If the fire is burning anywhere, it's burning everywhere. And we're just generating variants by having this uh, uh, ravage. And those variants will come back to bite us. It's bad for ethical reasons because every human life is of equal value. It's bad for economic reasons to restart the world economy. And we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars of economic damage. Uh, you actually need to put out the fire everywhere. And frankly, uh, this uh, pandemic has turned out to be an issue of national security and peace and security as well. So then to get closer to your question, let's ask ourselves, what's scarce? What's causing that inequity? And I want to talk about the three Ds, Roy, 
dollars, doses, and domestic manufacturing. <clears throat> In terms of dollars, uh, WHO with partners, Gavi, et cetera, have set up a mechanism called COVAX, part of the ACT Accelerator, um, which aims to distribute doses. It's distributed about 88 million doses to more than 100 countries. So it's a mechanism that works, but you can't distribute doses you don't have. And it's short about $16 billion, even after the G7 meeting. Uh, $16 billion shortfall just for this year alone in terms of buying and redistributing vaccines. And that's compared to a $9 trillion uh, estimate of economic benefits. So it's the highest return on investment you'd ever see. Um, in terms of doses, this is where we get to your point. I think they actually ended up with 870 million. They started with a billion, they ended up with 870 million. But that's against the 11 billion doses that are needed. And one of the um, positive things about the G7 meeting was Dr. Tedros, my friend and, and colleague, actually challenged the G7 and said, by the time you meet next year, we would like to see 70% of the whole world vaccinated. So it's 10% by September, 40% by December, 70% by the following spring. And then the third thing that's scarce is um, domestic manufacturing or local production. And this is where knowledge transfer, the TRIPS agreement, and all those things become very important, which I'll sure, I'm sure we'll get into. I'll just say here, Roy, that um, what this uh, pandemic, I think, has really taught us, unfortunately, is the limits of global solidarity uh, and the need for a better balance between the charitable model and self-reliance. And that's why sharing of know-how and uh, domestic manufacturing, at least on the regional level, is so important. Specifically zeroing in on your question, um, so the difference between that 1 billion and that 11 billion, which would take us to 70%, I mean, some of it will happen, uh, the, the, the 1 billion was how many doses the G7 would share, the 870 million. So over time, maybe they'll share more. Over time, uh, that of course doesn't count necessarily, that was a sharing number, so it doesn't count the domestic um, uh, production, the domestic of the G7 of other groups. More vaccines will come online. We now have, I think, eight vaccines and manufacturing facilities uh, that have WHO emergency use listing. Um, and uh, so you, that's where some of those extra doses will come from. But I don't want any of that rationale of where the doses will come from to obscure the fact that we have a supply shortage of vaccines in the world. And that's the main point. The supply is not adequate. So just rounding out these introductory remarks, Roy, um, I would say that where the world is at the moment is at its Mandela moment. It, we're really facing a collective Mandela moment as a world. It always seems impossible until it's done. And actually vaccinating 70% of the world's population by the next G7 meeting is going to be a challenge. Um, but it's our Mandela moment. The question is, can we rise to that challenge? And, uh, you know, the vaccine inequity is a very, very serious problem. And I'm sure we'll get into Canada and what other countries can do. But I'll just stop there by, by saying we have a lot of vaccine inequity. It's bad for all kinds of reasons, not only charity, but also self-interest, because those variants are going to bite us. The dollars are scarce, the doses are scarce, and the domestic production is scarce. And this is our Mandela moment that we have to rise to meet. Back to you, Roy. Thanks, Peter. Um, that was a great tour d'horizon. Uh, let me push you on a couple of points that you, you, you raise, and, and particularly the issue of uh, domestic production in the developing countries. Um, there's been a lot of debate, as you know, around uh, waiving the TRIPS agreement and uh, to enable developing countries have access to the property rights, to the patents, to the technology required to uh, produce uh, vaccines domestically. 
How important is this uh, as an issue in its own right? Um, so that's part one of a double barrel question. And two, supposing that we were successful in getting a TRIPS waiver or access to technology, what else would need to be done in order to get to the domestic production that you're talking about? I think it's extremely important. And that's why WHO is very, very focused on it. And by the way, WHO's position is uh, it hopes that countries will join India and South Africa who've proposed that uh, uh, TRIPS waiver. Uh, so our position is in favor uh, of WHO's position. And I'll come back to your point about what elements are needed in a second. Um, it's very important. Why is it very important? Because of the lesson we've learned. The lesson we've learned is uh, solidarity is important. We always say nobody's safe until everybody's safe. But at the same time, the empirical evidence around the distribution of vaccines and the inequities. Two out of three people in Canada have a first dose. One out of 100 people or one out of 50 people on the African continent have a first dose. That empirical inequity has shown the limits of solidarity. On the African continent, vaccines generally, Africa produces 1% of the vaccines that it uses. So we have to shift the balance between self-reliance or independence, at least at the regional level, and expecting charitable donations uh, globally. So there has been a strong effort by the African Union, for example, to identify sites um, for manufacturing. A lot of domestic support in South Africa, in Rwanda, in Senegal, Egypt, Morocco. And, uh, and so those efforts are underway. It's very important because it's a matter of um, regional security, regional sovereignty. This really is a national or a regional security issue, and it needs to be seen like that, and not just global, not only global supply chains alone. Um, having said that, one needs at least three elements, I think, to be successful. As I mentioned, WHO hopes that other countries will join. Uh, the TRIPS, uh, uh, the temporary TRIPS waiver, at least on the vaccine. The other thing you need is um, sharing of technology. Uh, and then we can get into more detail about the different types of vaccine platforms. Many people have heard about the mRNA technology. And WHO, in fact, has launched an mRNA technology transfer hub to assist in that uh, uh, transfer. And, and, you know, one of the main blockages, actually, Roy, is the know-how, because it's not just the recipe, it's actually the know-how or talent, shall we say, to make it. So at least those three elements, intellectual property, the actual technology, and, uh, and, and, and the know-how. And so to your question, um, I think in terms of ending this pandemic, even though in the next two to three months, still sharing will save lives more quickly than uh, local production. But even in terms of ending this pandemic, because for example, the mRNA facilities went from a vacant Polaroid factory in Boston to production in six months. So it's not uh, like it can't be done, um, even in terms of ending this pandemic, but certainly in terms of uh, variants, which require greater domestic production if boosters are required. And our, our position now is the evidence isn't clear that boosters will be required. So not saying they will be, but if they are, that's going to require more domestic production and certainly in terms of future vaccines. So uh, I think this local production is a very important issue. By the way, at our recent World Health Assembly, there was a resolution passed supporting it. It's very important and it requires the sharing of intellectual property, technology, know-how, and of course the financing that, that goes along with it. I think it's a very important issue, and I think uh, the pandemic's really shown the limits of being able to rely on others. Um, I was going to bring up the issue of the next pandemic uh, a bit later, but I'll, I'll bring it up now because if we're engaged in this um, debate about um, the limits of global solidarity and the need to think of uh, intellectual property in drugs and pharmaceuticals that are pu public health issues. 
um, shouldn't we be thinking longer term in terms of this shouldn't be a temporary trips waiver only, but we should, we should actually, even though we're in the throes of emerging from this pandemic, we should be thinking about future pandemics and positioning ourselves now, not when it's upon us, you know, uh, tooth and claw to uh, protect ourselves from the ravages of future pandemics. So are we in fact going far enough in the current debate about uh, intellectual property and transfer of technology, particularly for pharmaceuticals, uh, if we're going to do the job properly looking forward over the next generation or two. You, you're right, Roy. And um, uh, well, the first thing I'll say is even though I've been focused on vaccines and vaccine equity, I think everyone realizes that it's a one two punch of vaccines and other tools, diagnostics and drugs and oxygen, et cetera. And public health measures, being outside, masks, physical distancing, those two things really need to go together. So that's already broadening in the way you describe it. Focusing on the next pandemic, you know, one of the most important things that came out of the last World Health Assembly, which just ended two or three weeks ago, is an agreement to hold a World Health Assembly, a special session of the World Health Assembly, which, as you know, is the principal governance platform in the world where the world's governments come together to discuss health issues. So it actually, from a governance standpoint, I think about it as the G194 for health. And we can come back to the governance. That's a very inclusive governance uh, piece. Anyway, to hold a special session of the World Health Assembly in November focused on a pandemic treaty. And the pandemic treaty is that holistic look for future pandemics that you um that you were talking about Roy so it would involve the countermeasures if you will or the technologies be it vaccines or drugs or and then underneath that the issues we've been talking about the sharing the local production the, the structures etc it would include uh agreements on workforce and surges it would agree include potentially early warning uh, you know, the wide range and, and many other things. So the range of things that you would want to be sharing globally um, to uh, ensure that the world is safe, uh, is safe going forward. So people um, listening should focus in on that November meeting, the pandemic treaty or other instrument is the way the thing is framed. And this, by the way, from a governance standpoint, also, uh, I think people would be interested to know um, I mentioned governance is actually a comparative advantage of WHO. Part of that governance is it also has treaty making or at least treaty convening powers. It's only used that once historically, and that was the framework convention on tobacco control. Mm -hmm. But of course, it also um, is able uh, Can you still hear me, Roy? Yeah, loud and clear. Good. It's also able to, uh, there we go. It's also able to do international law, for example, the international health regulations and so on. So the, the more comprehensive instrument that we should be focused on together um, will be discussed by member states in the November World Health Assembly in terms of preparing for future pandemics. A very important question and a very important, probably the most important thing that came out of the last World Health Assembly by this uh, pandemic treaty. And that, of course, is negotiated among member states in a multilateral context, supported by the WHO Secretary. That's very encouraging. Uh, thank you for those comments. Um, I'm just going to uh, suggest to our audience, if you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A queue. They have a couple of questions already. I just got one or two more I'd like please. to raise with Peter, and then we'll go to our audience, if that's okay. Okay. Um, let me first ask, um, since you're a Canadian, a uh, distinguished Canadian, uh, what role can Canada play? What more can Canada do? Because a lot of us are feeling that Canada's not up to scratch in this one. It's, it's, it's uh, not a leader by any means. It's much more of a laggard in what it's providing, both in material terms and intellectually. So we'd, we'd welcome your, your thoughts on Canada's role. <laughs> 
Thank you, Roy. And I'm going to try to answer this question very factually and objectively, because my role, obviously, as an international public servant is to be an international public servant and not focus on um, uh, any individual country specifically, although I'm obviously a very proud Canadian. So what I would say, first of all, is Canada obviously is a strong, known as a strong champion for multilateralism. There's a strong history there, which is a positive. Canada has provided quite a bit of support for uh, the broader pandemic response, you know, because the direct deaths from COVID are the middle. Then you've got the indirect deaths from all the other health services that have been disrupted and they've been severely disrupted and we're way off track on the SDGs. And then you've got the other route run, which is maybe even bigger, uh, which is the, um, disruption of lives, livelihood, economic disruption, hunger, all the social implications. And Canada has done a lot with various UN agencies, especially on that third rung. By the way, um, in the middle rung, the confirmed deaths are about 3.8 million. Uh, and the true number of deaths are higher. So um, this is really the biggest uh, catastrophe crisis probably in 100 years. Anyway, so Canada is a strong multilateral player. It's been strong on the broader implications. When you zero in on the vaccination question we're focused on here in the 3Ds, it's been quite strong on its participation in COVAX and its funding for COVAX. In fact, it's only one of two G7 countries that's in a sense paid its fair share um, in terms of the donations, the financial support for the ACT Accelerator, and it's had an active engagement in the Council. So even though there's a $16 billion shortfall that I mentioned overall just for this year for the ACT Accelerator, Canada's actually paid its fair share. When you go to the second D, which is dose share, um, you know, this 100 million dose commitment that we saw at the G7 is a good first step. Um, but as my uh, friend and colleague, Dr. Tedros, has said generally, we need these doses, we need more doses and we need them faster. And in particular, one thing Canada could do is, um, well, I mean, I think, you, you know, the, the timeline for those 100 million doses, as for the billion doses, really matters. Because uh, if we're even to achieve 10% of vaccination by September in every country in the world, that requires an additional 250 million doses between now and September. So the timing matters. So that's on the doses. On the domestic manufacturing, there's text-based uh, negotiations, textual negotiations coming up in the World Trade Organization in a couple of weeks on the intellectual property waiver. So the United States, for example, has come out and said very clearly that it supports the intellectual property waiver. Um, uh, Canada has not, uh, to my knowledge, made that clear declaration. Um, there's also an upside potential here, Roy, which is, you know, Canada also doesn't have the domestic vaccine manufacturing capacity. Think about what happened. I mean, it started with Avro Aero and then Cannot Labs. And, and in the last budget, the government put 2.2 billion to help turn that around. So in a sense, there's some similarities between the lack of domestic manufacturing capacity in Canada and the lack of domestic manufacturing capacity on the African continent. So you almost wonder, and yet Canada is so strong scientifically, and, and, and so you almost wonder whether um, there's potential there mm -hmm. for some kind of mutuality of, uh, of support. So, uh, you know, that's, I think, a fair accounting for Canada. Strong history of multilateral leadership. Strong financial support of the broader impacts um, of the pandemic, which are very, very important. You know, from WHO's point of view, if the money, if money goes to the World Food Program to stop hunger, we're very happy. Uh, paying the fair share, actually, for Act A and COVAX, one of only two, two, only two of seven G7 countries have done that. So that's very good and active involvement. It's good that there's an announcement for dose sharing when those doses come, both from Canada and more generally is an extremely important question. And then finally, you know, potentially uh, on this domestic production, local production, um, there's the intellectual property waiver issue, the TRIPS waiver, 
And, and then I think there's some upside potential of potentially, potentially harnessing Canada's uh, innovative capacity, because in a sense, we're in the same boat. That's a great way of putting it. Uh, so there's uh, a win-win scenario, perhaps, whereby Canada also uh, establishes and, and broadens its own manufacturing capacity, as well as supporting that in developing countries to uh, face the problems on both sides, you know, uh, vaccine yeah. shortage on our side and fact, vaccine absence on, on the developing country side. Yeah, and by the way, I think people will be interested to know, just to diverge a little bit on the technology, part of that mRNA technology, something called lipid nanoparticles, which is how that mRNA gets into the cell, was actually developed. One of the key technologies was developed at the University of British Columbia. So there's a, a flag there. And, and then if you take a step back, what's amazing about this, which we should have mentioned, is incredible scientific advance. You know, I always learned in medical school, it would take 10 years to develop the vaccine, 15 Within one year when, of when WHO first, the first vaccine had emergency use uh, listing on December 31st of 2020. I mean, that was amazing. Incredible. And then I think about eight vaccines since. And the other really interesting thing, Roy, is of the various platforms here, the most, um, the least tested platform was the first out of the gate. So I don't know whether people fully realize that there actually is not another mRNA-based vaccine. The first one is the COVID vaccine. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at the viral vector platforms, like, for example, the AstraZeneca, and by the way, the mRNA is like the Pfizer, BioNTech, the Moderna, the CurePak, the, the viral vector platforms like the AstraZeneca, there's only one of those in existence, and that's the Ebola vaccine. And then the protein vaccine, people might have heard of the Novavax results recently, doesn't yet have emergency use uh, listing. Um, that's a relatively common vaccine not yet out of the gate and the commonest vaccine is the inactivated virus which is like um uh you know the Bharat vaccine the sino one of the indian ones one of the chinese vaccines uh, the sino vac and so um it's interesting that the most tried and tested kind of came last and the newest platform came first but the whole thing represents an incredible, unprecedented advance of science. Mm -hmm. uh, success of science, failure of equity, mm -hmm. shall we say, which is well, what we uh, talked about before. Okay, I see a lot of questions in the queue, and we'd better get to them because we've only got uh, 25 minutes left or so. Susan Tanner starts by thanking you for your excellent uh, remarks, uh, but she asks, what role can NGOs take that might make a difference? I think civil society is critical here. So if you look globally, um, if you look globally, you know, there's a spectrum of views on how to approach this 11 billion gap. But I would just point people to um, some of the recent work of NGOs like Oxfam, you cited Oxfam, uh, MSF and the work they're doing on access, Knowledge Ecology International, uh, the work of Jamie Love, and Public Citizen. I mean, Public Citizen, for example, uh, some months ago published a plan on $25 billion to vaccinate the world. And so very specific, very concrete work done, particularly in this intellectual property technology transfer uh, area. So I wanted to start with the more technical work because there's a lot of technical expertise that we're seeing in these uh, in in these NGOs in the civil society, and of course, um, you know, issues of finance, issues of dose sharing, which is not easy to do politically for any government because of the importance politically of filling domestic needs. Uh, those are all uh, influenced by domestic voices and domestic NGOs. So that's a dynamic that I think is very important. And then, and then finally, um, you know, we have issues uh, in global health and they've become more apparent in the pandemic of racism, of colonization and the need to decolonize. And so the voices, particularly of Southern based NGOs are very, very important to keep this grounded in the needs of uh, the people uh, that are being served around the world. So 
I would say to Susan, you know, at, at least three bits of very, very clear value. And I'm sure Roy, you're much more of an expert in this than I. You can list many others. But I would say the ability to look technically, including its solutions in, let's say, less conventional approaches, um, uh, access-based approaches, very, very important. The ability to do the domestic advocacy for the bill sharing is very important. And uh, the Southern Voices have been very, very important in, in many other ways, I'm sure. But I wanted to be specific in the, in the answer, Roy. Obviously, it's a very important, uh, very important role in this global uh, fight for equity. And, and the moral voice related to equity that you see from many NGOs. Very important. Great. Uh, moving on to a question by John Williams, uh, which I'll embellish slightly. He asked what role or can or will China play in meeting the need for the missing doses, the doses that we need to close the gap? And I'd add to that question um, Russia, because Russia has its Sputnik V uh, vaccine as well. One in the Western media, one seldom hears about these two players, and yet they've, they've been very active in supplying vaccines to the very countries that uh, the West is not supplying vaccines to. So do you have any, a comment on that? Yeah, I mean, the first point to make, and I think this is very clear, but let me make it explicitly, is this isn't about the COVID vaccine. This is about the COVID vaccines. And what's amazing is more than 200 candidates in the pipeline uh, you know, more than 50 in late stage clinical trials with different types of delivery systems, different platforms, um, uh, a dozen in use, I think about eight with emergency use listing from WHO. And uh, this is really a value of WHO. WHO is neutral as to the national source of these vaccines. WHO authorizes, provides emergency use listing authorization when vaccines are safe and effective. And um, so vaccines from all different countries in the world that develop and produce vaccines will be important because what we've got is a supply problem. So the more the supply of safe and effective vaccines, regardless of their origin, the better. And uh, that applies to the US, to Europe, it applies to Indian vaccines from India, vaccines from Russia, vaccines from... Having said that, the eight are uh, ones you know about, the, the eight with emergency use listing. And I say eight because each, each manufacturing site has its own emergency use listing, kind of the manufacturing, so the number of authorizations more than the number of vaccines. But it's, it's, um, it's the uh, Pfizer-BioNTech, Moderna... AstraZeneca, but also um, two of the uh, vaccines coming from China have had emergency use listing recently. The the Gamalea, the Sputnik one, um, is in uh, under evaluation, has not yet received emergency use listing. Um, there is, uh, and there are other ones from the United States, from Europe, from India, that are in the pipeline from emergency use listing as well. But we apply the same standards regardless of the origin. And that's one of the values of a multilateral organization like, uh, like WHO. This emergency use listing has, I think, really proved to be, to be important. Okay, still on the issue of China. Um, as you know, there's been a raging debate, uh, particularly in the U.S., about the Wuhan lab leak issue. Um, uh, in your view, what uh, credence uh, is there in uh, making this claim that uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus emerged from uh, a lab in, in Wuhan? And th does, it make, does it make a difference, even if that were the case, particularly with respect to looking at the generation of uh, uh, viral infections and pathogens in the future? The origins of pandemics are important. They often, why? Because then you can zero in on future preventive strategies. So I want to say, firstly, the origins are important. Secondly, sometimes they take quite a bit of time to actually figure out what the original uh, source is, whether there's an intermediate host, etc. 
Thirdly, um, WHO did convene an uh, independent panel of experts that did a phase one study that did provide useful information. Uh, but we're still at the point where um, the various options are on the table. Did it come through uh, a animal source, uh, uh, for example, wet market? Did it come uh, from a laboratory? Um, when that phase one investigation, um, the experts released their findings, uh, Dr. Tedros made very clear that the various options were still on the table, that more data was needed, um, and called for more data, and there's a phase two investigation uh, in, in the works. So the short answer, Roy, is it's not clear. I don't think anyone can say with certainty what the actual source was. Um, having said that, WHO, working with OIE and FAO, did call for a temporary suspension of wet markets uh, two, two months ago or so, and laboratory biosafety protocols can be uh, looked at, can be addressed uh, regardless. So um, uh, I think this phase two is the place for people to uh, people to focus a lot of calls at the World Health Assembly to build on the work of the of the phase one and to, to deepen the uh, um, inquiry into the source, into the origins. And the origins are important and they often take quite a while to, uh, to figure out. Okay, thanks. Jim Cornelius asks, would a more equitable distribution of the vaccines at the early stage, such that no country would have any large-scale vaccinations, would this have led to better outcomes overall? Yes. I mean, there's, there was modeling early on before the vaccines were available that showed that just simply how you distribute them mm -hmm. can affect the global death rate. Why? Because the risk of death is higher in certain people. It's higher in older people, for example, than in younger people. And if you're able to, from a global standpoint, target the vaccines to, um, to uh, people at highest risk, overall, you reduce uh, the, the total number of deaths. So there's no question that the allocation, the distribution, the global allocation and distribution of vaccines has an effect on the overall uh, death rate. For example, I don't know if you saw this, and I tweeted about this. I'm at, at Peter A. Singer on, on Twitter. Um, a couple of days ago, a professor at McCary University in Uganda said, look, COVID is on the rise here. It's, I think he used the word, it's, it's like a wildfire. And he tweeted a photo of nine, um, nine Ugandan professors, doctors, health workers who died in the last two weeks. Um, one got the impression mostly from COVID. And uh, so uh, there's an element of risk. There's also an element of, uh, of, of I don't know what the right word is, of, of, of sacrifice. I mean, imagine you're a nurse or a doctor or a health worker, and you're caring for your community at personal risk, like those health workers. You deserve protection. That's the least reciprocal obligation of the government of the society. And unfortunately, um, you know, with 1% vaccination rates or less in some African countries, not even all health workers have been protected. So what we have is kind of fireworks in New York State celebrating high vaccination rates and the opening of restaurants and deaths of nine health workers in Uganda who are paying the ultimate sacrifice who are taking care of their communities and putting themselves at risk. There's a fundamental injustice there. Uh, I often use the word equity, use the word injustice. That is a fundamental injustice, a global injustice. And you have to ask yourself about the ethical basis of that. Um, or if I might just take a quick diversion, uh, Abdullah Dar Sali Benatar and I wrote a piece when I was in the bioethics business in 2005, I think, 2003, in, a, in international affairs. And essentially, we argued there was a hierarchy here between a, a cascade of values, equity, solidarity, and empathy. Because if you 
without a sense of solidarity, nobody cares about equity. And without a sense of empathy, nobody cares about solidarity. So um, I think there will be time to reflect on uh, our values, on that cascade of values, and how it is that we feel comfortable with um, you know, vaccinating relatively low risk people in rich countries and fireworks in New York and restaurants. And isn't it wonderful? And it is wonderful. It's a triumph of science. Whilst uh, nine health workers are paying the ultimate sacrifice for doing nothing more than caring for their communities in Uganda, which has a vaccination rate, I think, in the one to two percent to one to two percent range. That's that's unjust. And we should just be frank about that. And then the question is, well, how we how we uh, how we resolve that injustice. And that's why at the beginning I talked about our Mandela moment, because this is an issue of um, it's a political moment. It's a it's a political decision to just do the right thing as quickly as possible and then arrange the world in such a way that that gets done. Thank you. Yes, um, that would certainly echo with um, the book that Mark Carney has recently published on values, uh, where he calls for searching reflection and conversation and what's happened to our social values and, and addressing those in the near future, because without that, we don't have a moral compass with which to address any of these issues, whether it's uh, on the health front or climate change or financial crises. Mm -hmm. And I'm a little biased, but could I just say that, you know, I, I went to WHO with Tedros, uh, first African director general in seven years, and uh, people reached their own conclusions. But I think it's fair to say that he's been an extremely important leader in terms of being a voice of moral clarity. So, for example, his challenge to the G7 is vaccinate 70 percent of the world by the time you all meet next year. Mm -hmm. Very clear strong on sharing of dollars and doses and intellectual property. Uh, he feels these deep, these issues deeply. And I think it might be, you know, uh, not only his principled commitment, but uh, his, his own lived experience. And um, let me just cap that off and we can go into this a little more deeply if you wish. One of the key lessons of the pandemic is it's really been an x-ray of our soul. And it's really shown how important leadership is at all levels, from the head of government to community leadership to the leadership of international organizations. In a sense, Roy, you could argue leadership is the most effective vaccine mm -hmm. against the conjoint global challenges we face, be it the pandemic or climate or racism or economic inequality. Okay, I'm going um, to the Q&A list. Some fail the Lumpa picks up on your earlier comments about a whole spectrum of vaccines being available. And he points out um, there are the two Cuban ones, and even he mentioned Sputnik 3. Are they being assessed for e efficacy? And then countries like Cuba could be assisted in producing more. Yeah, the Cuban ones um, are in trials. Uh, are, are in clinical trials. And so, um, you know, it's generally after the phase three clinical trials that people start to present their data to WHO. Um, and uh, the, uh, as you know, Cuba has a very strong history of vaccine production. Uh, it had the world's first uh, meningitis B vaccine, if I'm remembering this correctly, about 20 years ago. Um, and so there's a strong history of vaccine production, including protein-based vaccines. There are several uh, Cuban vaccines. We're not yet at the point of some of these later ones uh, that you see reporting. Uh, but again, WHO is agnostic in terms of uh, the country of origin. We look for safety and efficacy. And the more safe and efficacious vaccines there are in the world, the better. Okay, moving on to um, John Williams, who says, rightly or wrongly, the WHO took a beating for its early response to the pandemic. How is it able to regain its reputation as a credible advocate for world health? Yeah. Um, well, that's a very interesting question. Um, 
There's the first thing to say is WHO is a learning organization. There's been an independent panel report that released recently, in fact, several of them. Um, and uh, there's lessons all around. I mean, maybe the shortest thing I can say, because I know we're short on time, is a couple of things. Firstly, I think people will be um, surprised to find that there's a 50-fold difference, at least a 50-fold difference in cumulative mortality among even G20 countries. So on January 30th, 2020, WHO issued its highest level of global alert, public health emergency of international concern. Through January, the alerts escalated. And um, basically, the countries that listened tended to do well, and the countries that didn't tended to do less well. I'm highlighting the importance of national leadership. I'm highlighting the variation. And I'm highlighting the very quick and early warning uh, of, uh, of, of WHO. So I think there's learnings all around. I think there's lessons to be learned. But I think WHO's response was quite robust from when it first heard of the um, virus on December 31st, 2019, to when it issued its highest level of global alert on January 30th, 2020, at a time when there were less than 100 cases and no deaths outside of China. And I think then the question is, between January 30th and today, who listened and what did uh, what did uh, national leaders and countries do? And that's even before you get to the COVAX distribution of 80, 80 million plus vaccines, the emergency use listings, the sharing of good practices, the treaty, the, the 150 times that Dr. Ted Rose and his colleagues met the world media and provided. You know, I think WHO's response has been quite uh, quite uh, quite robust. And then finally, um, you know, it's true that WHO was uh, quite severely um, criticized by the Trump administration. And uh, I think it's also true that Dr. Tedros had a very stable and principled approach throughout the pandemic. And I actually feel quite proud of his leadership through that period of time. And, and that obviously was a difficult time when the US administration said, announced its intention after 70 years to exit the WHO, something that the Biden administration has thankfully reversed. Okay, we have uh, six or seven questions. That's what, well, let's try our best to get through them in the next uh, five or 10 minutes. Uh, Sarah Hildebrand, who is with the Love My Neighbor Project has obviously been doing her, her math and she asks, uh, she says, Prime Minister Trudeau has just visited the Pfizer manufacturing plant in Belgium, and we learned that this one plant produces 100 million doses per month, or 1.2 billion per year. Does a spreadsheet exist with expected doses for each month and each year for every manufacturing plant in the world, producing a vaccine that is WHO approved? And if so, how close is this total to the 11 billion needed by June 2022? That's a very good question, Sarah. And uh, yes, I'm sure it exists, and I don't have it in my head. But the place to go would be um, would be to the COVAX site, where there actually are such projections, even in terms of COVAX's own uh, distribution effort, which, by the way, I think is probably better documented than the total global production. Um, but uh, I think that's the place to go in, uh, to to uh, to look. And again, it's a little unpredictable, right? Because new vaccines are always coming online, um, and uh, having emergency use listing, manufacturing is ramping up. So there's no question that the problem now is supply. There's no question that the supply is increasing. Um, there's also no question, by the way, that in certain places, there's a demand side problem. We didn't talk about the trust issues and, and so on. We could. Um, uh, but uh, that's the place to go to uh, look. And one of the other uncertainties, of course, is the variants, the need for boosters. And again, our position is that at the moment, there's no other need for boosters. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and, and so on. And what that boils down to, Roy, is a matter of time. Mm 
And that's why that 70% estimate, 70% uh, of the world vaccinated by uh, next year um, does take into account those type of uh, projections, but it's a stretch goal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm sorry, I can't provide a better answer for Sarah. <laughs> I think that was a good answer. Um, let me go to Richard Harmston, who uh, picks up on the prevention of future pandemics issue. Uh, what is the thinking at WHO about measures towards prevention, or at least the minimizing of their impacts in the future? Yeah, I mean, to go right to the root, Richard, pandemics start at the animal-human interface. So a much greater sensitivity to the One Health issues and how we interact with animals um, is a very uh, kind of root cause, root issue. Beyond that, the early warning systems are important. So for example, the government of Germany is supporting the WHO hub on epidemic and pand pandemic intelligence. And, uh, and the UK government is supporting a WHO hub on pandemic radar. So there's the, excuse me, the animal human interface and the One Health issues. There's the early warning systems. But the reason I went into some detail about that variation in cumulative mortality um, is it's not just transmitting the signal. On January 30th, the alarm bells were ringing, the sirens were blazing. The question is what people do with that information. And so that kind of thing is going to need a different type of approach. Part of its leadership, Part of it is the dynamic response to those kind of signals. You know, in the international health regulation, we measure preparedness by things like laboratory capacity and various static measures like that. What this has taught us about our measures is the need for dynamic measures of preparedness. And that's why WHO's, for example, adopted intra-action reviews. So as the pandemic's unfolding, um, reviewing performance. It, it almost starts to look more like, and I don't take this metaphor the wrong way, war games, which are dynamic measure, the dynamic preparedness or tabletop exercises, more so than just whether you have a particular laboratory capacity alone, which is necessary but not sufficient. And of course, those dynamic measures do ultimately devolve into leadership, into multi-sectoral approaches across different, uh, different um, parts of government. Okay, back to the TRIPS waiver. John Foster says achievement of the TRIPS waiver would probably required committed leadership. The Canadian government has refrained from support for the waiver and often talked in diversionary fashion. What uh, do you think, Peter, might lead to Canadian support for the TRIPS waiver? Yeah. You know, I think the more we can identify... Let me, let me just say this generically as well, because you'd understand better the dynamics of intellectual property. And there's a whole sub storyline in Canada about camera and people will have seen bio lies and, and uh, capacity there. Um, but let me just say this. I think um, the more specific we can be about concrete bottlenecks, the better. So um, the AU has a very strong approach in terms of domestic manufacturing. We know there's um, three to five countries that are moving forward on their plans on domestic manufacturing. We know they need uh, technology and know-how and financing. I think working, for example, with the AU, with the WHO hub, on what are the specific bottlenecks? Is it intellectual property? Is it know-how? Is it finance? Is it at any particular time? If you can, the more granular and specific we can all be about identifying the bottlenecks, I think the better, because the ultimate goal is actually to have vaccines rolling off manufacturing lines in Africa, let's say arguably by the end of the year, whatever your timeline is. That's the goal. Work backwards from there and identify the specific bottlenecks. And I think the more specific we can be in our asks, uh, the better. Um, here, you know, I did reference the public citizen, $25 billion for 8 billion vaccine doses. That's quite specific in terms of how it goes about things in let's, uh, uh, maybe I'll just leave that there. But basically the, the more specific we can be about bottlenecks, 
the more practical and the less ideological these discussions become, because there are obviously very legitimate different views about intellectual property and its importance. But we should work on the same fact base. Peter, do you have five more minutes so that we can cover a couple of, of these remaining questions? Okay. I'd be delighted, and I apologize for blathering on and no, uh, no, it's all been using great. up the time. I'm sorry. Thank you. Sam Feilan Lungpa comes with another question. He offers greetings to Dr. Singer. Um, Thank you. While the global situation, he says, is unequal in terms of vaccine coverage, what is also of great concern is that the vaccine coverage may not also cover those who are traditionally not well covered by services, for example, excluded and marginalized populations. That's a terrific point. And uh, that's a terrific point. And um, here, it really highlights the importance of equity, not just among countries, but also within countries. There's some bright lights on the horizon here. Uh, for example, if you look at the work of um, uh, the Black community in Toronto, and in particular, this has been written up by Kwame McKenzie from the Wellesley Institute, it's true that there was a very high uh, basically the death rates from COVID, the case rates and the death rates were higher in, um, in the black community, the black community itself organized black organizations, uh, people of color. Um, they pushed for more disaggregated data that showed that they pushed for, um, ultimately a greater focus on public health measures in those communities and then greater vaccine distribution in those communities. Um, to the point where the differential was decreased. Uh, so there's actually quite a positive story of the use of disaggregated data, the targeting of particular measures um, uh, there. The other communities uh, that I, where I think there's a, a potentially a positive story, I mean, uh, you know, it's a such a sad month to be talking about um, indigenous communities. With the, we faced evil with the discovery of 215 children and so on. What we have seen in indigenous communities, however, in COVID, I think, looking from outside the country, have been indigenous leaders themselves organizing, describing, participating in vaccination drives. Um, I'm hoping that that will be a relatively positive story of the a pandemic, I think it's still unfolding. And then the final thing I'd like to say about this is, you know, we talk about vaccine hesitancy. It's actually not hesitancy in communities. What this is really about most of the time is communities that have been exploited by people in power. I mean, if you had had uh, your children taken away, if people had done medical experiments on your community without your consent, et cetera, you might not trust them either when they came along with it. So I actually think fundamentally this is about trust. It's about community building. It's about community leaders leading the way from within those communities. Representation matters. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's what I think is the equity lesson within countries of the, uh, of, of, of the pandemic. And maybe these vaccine equity in-country issues will be an entry point for tracking an equitable recovery because we're way off track on the SDGs. We need to get back on track that will require an equitable and green and resilient recovery. And to do that, we'll need to track this aggregated data. And some of these little examples that I, I'm, I'm uh, showing, I think uh, may help sh shine the way. And I'm not arguing that every marginalized and disadvantaged community has been treated fairly because I'm sure they have it. But I am arguing that the sensitivity to this, and there have been some positive examples, at least that I'm aware of in, in, in Canada, and that intra-country equity is just as important as uh, among country equity. Okay, um, does the current talk about getting to the bottom of the source of COVID-19, asks Robert Miller, does this talk pose a political threat to strengthening international cooperation for more equitable vaccination? I, I think that, um, and uh, Dr. Tedros has made this same point, what's really important is to look at the origin situation, at least for, for an international organization like the WHO, 
to um, uh, and Dr. Tedros actually really requested uh, countries to do this as well to to look at this as a scientific matter as much as possible because it is at its essence a scientific matter um, and so I think that's really the way we would like to approach it. Um, there are enormous geopolitical implications of any pandemic like this in a bipolar world and people have seen those playing out and you referenced there one of the questions was a little bit about that when you asked about the reputation of who and the criticism that it's had and so on so um uh, thing there's no question that the origins issue does tend to uh mingle with let's say geopolitics but from who standpoint and from my standpoint as an international public servant uh, the issue is actually to get to the bottom of the origins that's hard enough to do scientifically and uh we really would like to focus on it as a as a as a scientific uh matter but i also don't question the premise of the question uh and i think anybody that reads any newspaper or, would understand that the premise of that question is reasonable. Okay, last question from Julie Rochon, who asks, what are the financial tools we could leverage to fill that 11 billion dose gap? And she asks, blended finance, an Africa impact fund for local biotech and pharma developing flat platforms to develop affordable and thermostable vaccines for COVID-19, as well as other vaccines for diseases that will meet the needs of underserved population. Is there a role for new and innovative finance, in other words? There is, but let me actually start with public finance, because I think one of the key lessons of the pandemic is the critical role of government and public finance. And so, um, when you talk about $11 billion, $16 billion, the shortfall this year in, in Act A, there's a $50 billion proposal from the IMF, et cetera, to vaccinate the world. There was a $60 billion proposal for this year and next from Gordon Brown to the G7. Whether it's 11, whether it's 50, whether it's 60, might seem like a lot of money, but the economic cost of this pandemic in dollars alone is in the tens of trillions of dollars. It's the best public investment that any government could make or set of governments could make. So that's the starting point, public mm -hmm. finance. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, you know, when you forecast forward, yes, there's been quite a bit of, uh, actually, let me just make one other point. So, those numbers tend to deal with the global countermeasures. Don't forget the communities. Pandemics start and end in communities. So that 16, 50, 60 billion is kind of heavy on vaccines and, and the global countermeasures. It's light on supporting preparedness plans at the national level, primary health care at the national level. Think about paying community health workers data systems at the national level. So there's another tranche there that needs to be thought about in terms of national finance and the importance of public finance. Then we get to the point that we realize that there's been a lot of stimulus spending um, and public finance will be tight going forward. And you already see this in some G7 countries, unfortunately. So we do have to start to think about innovative finance, which is the point of the question. That can be development banks, it can be regional development banks, and it can also, which is a, tend to be an overlooked source of finance in, in global health, can be special drawing rights. So there's a whole suite of multilateral finance beyond the pure public domestic governments. And then we get to the private sector. So there's about 90 trillion uh, in GDP probably 75% of it or whatever is in the private sector. And yes, I do think it would be helpful if there were some impact oriented um, investments in relevant things like, for example, vaccine manufacturing. Um, and I think that could be uh, potentially very helpful because the recovery is not going to be cheap. So it's ending the pandemic, preventing the next one but also the recovery. We were off track on the SDGs before. We're way off track now. And those investments are going to be needed to help for recovery. So I think, yes, uh, 
public finance first, but I think there potentially are opportunities for blended and innovative finance. An area that hasn't succeeded at scale, by the way. So I was involved in helping to establish a hundred million dollar fund, the Global Health Investment Fund, um, which had very strong social benefits, good financial returns, kind of that double. But the problem with that whole field is you do one hundred million dollar fund, and then you do the next hundred million, and it's not at scale. So the real question is how to set up a capital stack where the domestic finance provides some risk protection for the development banks, the development banks provide some risk protection for the impact oriented, uh, socially oriented private capital, et cetera. And that whole area, that whole system is not at scale and, and, and it's not organized in a way that it does scale. And by the way, I think WHO can have an important role here because the other lesson I learned from doing this is you have to start with your programmatic and your social objectives, not your financial objectives. So WHO it has 150 country offices, tons of social capital and trust with governments around the world. And so being able to align, um, you know, the domestic spending with, let's say, the development bank spending in a country or loans, generally concession loans with, let's say, impact-oriented private capital and making sure those all serve the government's purposes in terms of its obligation to its citizens, I think is a piece of the puzzle that we'll see more and more of um, as we move forward, especially in the, in the recovery. By the way, we boiled down the 50 health-related SDG targets into three big things, universal health coverage, healthier populations and health emergence. I won't go through them in detail, but um, the shortfall in the universal health coverage billion is um, 710 million between 2018 and 2023 out of a billion. So even compared to the SDG target for universal health coverage in SDG 3.8, there's massive shortfalls even before you factor in COVID. And so there's a lot of work that needs to be done to get to health for all. Primary health care will have an incredibly important role that relies on community health workers. So I wanted to go there, Roy, because we started this with the concept of equity and global vaccination. And, you know, my background is in innovation. We talked about finance. We talked about it. At the end of the day, <coughs> pandemics, primary health care, they start and end in communities. And we must not forget that national level or community level work in health. And uh, yeah, so it's our Mandela moment. The pandemic's been an x-ray of our soul. It's shown both solidarity and the limits of solidarity. It's shown the importance of leadership. Um, and uh, I think provided a number of important lessons for us to uh, uh, for us all to uh, learn and maybe just in closing, um, you know, I wasn't the biggest fan of the multilateral system when I went there in 2017, I'd always worked outside, but I've really come to have an abiding respect for the role of multilateralism in terms of leadership, as I've seen Tedros leadership. In terms of the importance of inclusive governance, I was joking about that G194, but that's a very important thing works and all and about uh and about the um importance of action at the country level and one of the other real comparative advantages of who is that footprint of 150 country offices and the close social bond with uh, government so i've uh, come out of this experience um with a really abiding respect for the importance of multilateralism uh, and, and multilateral international uh, organizations. And of course, you'd say, oh, the guy works in one, why should we? I, mean, I think you, you all are committed to that in the first place, but I just want, want to signal that my own view has really, really shifted as I've seen it up close in the middle of a crisis and how the world and the most vulnerable people in the world would be so much worse off without the multilateral system. And, and I would go so far as to say without WHO. The world would be much worse off without it. I mean, just imagine a world without WHO in this crisis. It would be terrible. And I'm quite proud of uh, what WHO has done, what Tedros has done, recognizing that all of us have uh, lessons to learn and we have to approach uh, 
our responsibilities with a lot of humility because of very, very serious, serious moments, serious crisis, and serious uh, set of decisions and need for leadership. Great. Uh, that's a great point on which to, to end. And uh, I'd like to thank you, Peter, for being so forthcoming, so candid, and so ample in your responses to some pretty thorny questions. Uh, I think uh, none of these issues are, are simple or easy. Uh, they, they have complexity and they have to be thought about systematically and, and with great sophistication. And I think you've done all of those things. So we feel fortunate in having had you as a speaker for the group of 78 and to end on a note of multilateralism that was one of the original calls that was made in, by the group of 78 that signed a declaration in eight, 1981 to prime minister trudeau the first uh, saying that strengthening multilateralism was an important thing for canada yeah. to do i think that's great roy and can i just thank you for this opportunity to be i mean i could tell from the questions that these are your colleagues here are practitioners uh, in multilateralism. And, and let me just say that obviously I'm here as an international public servant with neutrality, but I am a very proud Canadian. And, and looking at the role of Canada in the world, uh, the freedoms that we have, and, and I think even a fair assessment of uh, many of the things that Canada has done in relationship to the pandemic. Um, uh, I think, you know, we have a balanced view very thankful, for example, of the financing on COVID. There's some very positive uh, things to say um, about uh, about Canada, and like any uh, and and thank thankfulness to to express. And uh, you know, like I said for WHO, I think uh, you know we can all see how um, uh, we all need to work harder to make the world a safer and healthier place. Right. <laughs> so once again, Peter, thank you. Good luck with uh, your future endeavors uh, with the WHO and uh, let's be in touch. Thank you, Roy. It's a real pleasure to be with you and, and to all the folks that are listening and ask uh, questions and good luck in, in your work. Multilateralism matters. So thank you for your contributions. And thanks to all our listeners, our audience, for such great questions. And thanks to Sarah Bowles, who's been uh, in the control room, uh, lest anything uh, went off the rails, which it didn't. So <laughs> thank you all and stay in, in touch with the Group of 78. We've got an annual conference coming up at the end of September on adaptation to climate change. Uh, so uh, check your email and uh, check our website for updates. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye.